Has anybody been watching the Winter Olympics? They are coming to an end today, I'm aware of that. Um, now, I have to admit, I am not an athlete, as that comes as a surprise to no one here. Um, and I'm, I'm also not a great sports fan, but I love the Olympics. And uh, in, the su- in the Summer Olympics, you know, I get to see a lot of, you know, long jumping and sprinting. But then when I watch the Winter Olympics, as a non-athlete, I cannot understand how they do the things they do. I see the, f- the figure skating and the ice dancing and they're like throwing their bodies up into the air, defying gravity, spinning with such like precision and grace, and then landing on ice. And I don't understand how they do it. I have no idea how they can control their bodies that way. And then I watch something like, um, like the luge, and they're just hurling down um, at, at just breakneck speed. I looked it up, like 80-something miles per hour, you know, at risk of their lives for the sport, for the luge. And then if that weren't enough, someone decided, hey, let's make the luge even more dangerous. Why don't we go head first and call it the skeleton? And they're zipping down the luge at, at, at these amazing speeds, risking their lives with, with their heads at the front to break the fall. And, you know, because I'm weird, when I see the snowboarders and the figure skaters and the, and the skeleton people, whatever you call them, I start to imagine what their lives must be like. And I think, okay, they're risking their lives and bodily injury. What else have they given up? And I start to imagine, you know, some of these athletes are only 15 years old. Some of them are in their 30s, and they've given up decades of their lives for this sport. And I imagine all the Friday nights that they gave up when their friends went out and they practiced. And I imagine even giving up degrees and careers and school to, to be homeschooled so they can follow the sport and giving up um, different parts of their lives, their social lives, their family lives, spending week in and week out, giving up all the foods that they like, less ice cream and donuts, so that they can discipline their bodies, so that they can achieve these amazing feats of sport. And I wonder, why do they do it? Why would you give up so much to be able to do these things? Well, we don't have to wonder why, do we? If you simply Google Winter Olympics, what you're going to find is about 100 articles written about this one word, it's going to show up. You probably know what I'm going to say. It's about glory. They do it for the glory. They do it for the Olympic glory. They do it for the glory of their nation. They do it for the glory of their name and their family. And they spend their lives trying to pursue this glory. And so I realized, you know what? I can understand. I can understand these athletes because I do the same thing. I pursue my own glory And I'll make sacrifices for that. And when I'm not pursuing my own glory, I'm pursuing a glory that I can possess through food and drink and beauty. So I know what it's like to pursue glory. But you know what I find about glory um, is evidence in in these winter Olympic athletes is that glory is often elusive and it's fleeting. In the Olympics, only a few people get the gold medals. And guess what? They're forgotten. Do you remember who won the skeleton last year? Or who won the figure skating gold medal last year? We don't remember them. And so glory, even when we pursue it on such a global scale as the Winter Olympics, is elusive and fleeting. So what does that have to do with our passage today? Well, in this passage that's so famous, one of the most memorable passages uh, of the teachings of Jesus we see that Jesus is talking about the glorious life. How do we find true and lasting glory? How do we find a life that's worth living? And this is what he says. He says, the glorious life is possible, but it's found in me. But the catch is you have to give up your entire life to get it. He says, you you can have lasting glory, but you have to go through the cross to get it. And so we're going to look at three points today 
If you're a note taker, I'll go ahead and tell you. We're going to look at the paradox of the cross, the problem of the cross, and then the promise of the cross. So let's look at the paradox of the cross. If we look at the context of this passage, the first three verses, I'm not going to look at as much because Kyle looked at those last week, but basically what happened in those verses is that Peter is kind of the mouthpiece of God. He says, Jesus, you are the Christ. You are the anointed one of God. And then quickly he becomes the mouthpiece of Satan because Jesus says, well, to be the Messiah, I have to suffer and die and give my life. And Peter says, no, that's not, the way, that's not what Messiahs are supposed to do. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. And so this is kind of a roller coaster for Peter, right? And we have to hear that shock and suspense that the disciples would have experienced. There's shock. Jesus is, you're going to die? You have to die? That's not what's supposed to happen. But then there's also some suspense, right? Because the very next thought you're going to have, if you're Peter, if you're James or John, you're going to think, wait, we've been participating in the work of Jesus. We fed the thousands with him. We cast out demons with him. We preached the gospel with him. If he's going to die, what does that mean for us? What about us? If he's going to be rejected by all the leaders of his day, what does that mean for us? If we've participated in everything else, do we have to participate in his death too? Are they going to kill us too? That's the question that's lingering on their minds. They've received the shock that he's going to die, and now they're wondering, what's going to happen to me? And in verse 34, Jesus starts to answer that question. And in 34, he says, and calling the crowd to him with his disciples. That phrase is important because some some translations may have, he summoned them. And what's going on here is some military language. The way we might say it today is he rallied the troops. And so they're thinking, what's going to happen to us? Are we going to die too? And so Jesus rallies the troops. And the scene we get here is kind of like a battlefield speech It's about to happen. Jesus is the general. His disciples and the crowd are his troops, and he's going to speak something to inspire them. Or maybe you think of like a locker room halftime speech. You know, like I said, I'm not a big sports fan, but I watched a lot of locker time speeches this week. Um, And here's one thing they all have in common. I can just tell you the bottom line of every locker room speech is this. Win! If you watch like 20 of them, it's kind of comical. Um, go out there and win. We got to out-tackle them, out-hustle them, out-block them, out-pass them, you know, and we'll win. No locker room speech says, just, it's okay to lose. The locker room speeches are a way to, to get everybody pepped up and inspired to win. And it's the same way with a battlefield speech, right? Think of the most famous battlefield speech you can remember. For me, it's um, from, from the Shakespearean play, Henry V. And by play, I mean the movie with Kenneth Branagh. Um, because plays are meant to be seen, right? What does he say in that famous battle scene? There's this tiny little group of soldiers that have to go fight the French army on St. Crispin's Day, the Battle of Agincourt. And he says, Do you you remember the line? He says, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers. He's saying, it it doesn't matter that there's only a few of us. He says, we're going to win. He says, all the people that are still back in England that you're wishing could fight with us, they're going to think they're cursed because they're not here today. Because we're going to be remembered. We're going to have a legacy. And it's going to last until the end of the world. They're going to remember us by name, that we had victory today. And they all yell, yeah, we're going to fight. And one guy even says, hey, I'm so inspired now. We don't need the rest of the people, just you and me. Let's go fight the French army. And he even says, we do this. We should be glad that there are a happy few of us because there are less of us to share the glory of the victory. And so this is what's about to happen is a battlefield speech when the disciples are asking, what's going to happen to us? What's going to happen to us? And Jesus rallies the troops together and he gets ready to give this rousing speech to tell them how to fight. 
In fact, in the ancient world, they had battlefield speeches too, about 400 years before the time of Christ. This famous war writer named Xenophon, a student of Socrates, wrote kind of a, a war manual called Anabasis. And in his version of the battlefield speech, it's again, it's like, it's like Henry V, there's this fight that's about to happen, they're outnumbered, and this is what he says, whoever is desirous of saving his life, let him strive for victory. For it is the victors that slay and the defeated that are slain. In other words, if you want to save your life, fight. It's life or death. So fight for your life and strive for victory. Now Jesus, on the other hand, offers this speech. He says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. There's no rousing speech. There's no strive and fight for victory. It's the opposite. He says, if you want victory, if you want the glorious life, if you want to save your life, you have to lose it. This is the coach that says, go out there and let the team score. This is the, the general that says, lay down your life, give your life. There's a paradox. He says, if you want to save your life, if you want victory, if you want glory, then you have to give your life away. You have to deny yourself and follow me. And see, this paradox, Jesus is saying, I'm not the only one that's dying here. Yes, I'm going to die. And if you want to follow me, you will have to die as well. Your life will be demanded of you. Your, your life needs to be turned upside down. You need to reorient your values to me because I am life. You have to make me the center of your life. Now that goes against everything we know, right? Right? We're, we're not much different from Xenophon. We live in this dog-eat-dog -dog world. If you want to get ahead, you got to fight. you got to work hard. you got to put in the time. And then when it comes to Jesus, he says, take up your cross and deny yourself. Give up your life and follow me. You've got to give in order to receive. You have to die in order to live. Now, when Mark was writing these words and Jesus said these words, he was talking to the disciples and the crowds, and we know the story, right? We know that they didn't follow him to death eventually. But many of them, after he rose from the dead and they received the Holy Spirit, many of them did, um, many of them were persecuted. Many of them were asked to give their lives for Jesus. And so sometimes maybe we think, okay, I've got to give up my life for Jesus. What does that mean? Well, I have a friend named Jacob who um, grew up in Malaysia, but now in his retired years, he lives in New York City. And he doesn't live there because he doesn't love his family or he doesn't miss Malaysia. He lives in New York City because he is forbidden to return to Malaysia. He is exiled from his country for sharing the gospel. See, he considered Christ more valuable. He considered Christ the greatest source of life, more valuable than his, his own homeland, more valuable than his hometown, more valuable than living near his family. And so he lives in New York City. He continues to share the gospel there. And so we, we see these grand displays of devotion. We see the disciples who gave their lives when they were persecuted for the sake of Jesus because they believed that Jesus was better, that he was more glorious than the glories of this world. But what does that mean for us? Most of us don't, aren't going to have that. Um, most of us are not going to be asked to give our lives. Most of us are not going to be asked to leave our country for the sake of the gospel. So does this mean anything for us? You know, sometimes we do kind of the thought experiment, right? Would I take a bullet for Jesus? Would I give up my life? But I have another friend 
who is recently married, and like most newlyweds, she is smitten with her husband and took to Facebook to display all of his virtues. And in a recent post, she said something like this. She said, I have the best man. I needed an ingredient while he was at the store, and I called him, and he had already finished paying and was walking out the door. But when I called, he said, oh, I can get that. And he jumped back in line and got what I needed. Man, I got one of the good ones. This man moves mountains to help me and make me happy. Now we can chuckle, right? That was a very small sacrifice. You know, that impressed her. He moves mountains. He got back in line. He walked back into the store and got some flour and then went through the line for me. He moved mountains. But when we love someone, it's not just the grand displays of devotion and love and commitment that matter. It's the daily small sacrifices of time and energy that communicate our love and our commitment, right? If you said, yes, I love my wife, I would take a bullet for her, but that's the extent of my love and I will never do anything else for her, then you would question, do you actually love your wife? No, to love your wife means that you make countless sacrifices, countless small displays of your devotion and commitment every single day. You live for your family. You live for your wife or your husband and your children. That's how you show your love. And I think it's no different as we apply this passage. Yet maybe we aren't going to have a gun held to our head. Maybe we won't be exiled from our countries. Maybe some of us will. But all of us are required to give up to deny ourselves for the sake of Jesus, to consider him more worthy than anything else we have. And when he requires those small sacrifices, that's how we show our love and devotion to him. And here's the thing, I think he sees it and he notices it. Just like my friend who's talking about how she has the best man, I think Jesus notices our small sacrifices He doesn't just say, hey, look at Peter. He was crucified for me. He doesn't say, hey, just look at Jacob. He left his country. I think he looks at all of us and says, look, they they give up their money for me. They've given their time for me. They've given relationships for me. They've sacrificed their desires and their own glory for mine. And he sees those sacrifices and he counts it as devotion. And so he asks us not just to give our lives physically, but to consider him worth more than our lives in every part of our lives. But to really understand this passage, I don't think we can just see the paradox of the cross, that the way to life is death. I think we have to look even further into this passage, and when we do, we see there's a greater problem here. And so that's our second point, the problem of the cross. Now, when I used to hear this passage, I used to think when Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, that that was something like literary foreshadowing. Like, well, of course they didn't know the end of the story the way we know the end of the story. We know that Jesus went and died on the cross. And they didn't know that, so maybe they were just thinking, you know, Jesus was giving them a clue so that after it happened, they would say something like, oh, that's what he meant. But see, now what I've realized is that the cross was really common in their time. The cross was a Roman form of execution. And they had probably seen very many crucifixions. So they knew what it meant to take up your cross. And even that phrase, take up your cross, had a meaning because the cross was was a cruel form of execution. And when criminals, usually the lower class criminals or insurrectionists, people that they would consider treasonous or traitors, when they were crucified, they they were forced to carry their cross to where they were hung. See, we might say it this way, like someone is forced to dig their own grave. They were forced to walk through the city carrying a piece of the cross, the cross that would actually bring their death so that everyone could see them, so that they would be a spectacle to everyone on their way to be hung outside the city and killed. And the disciples had seen this. Those who followed Jesus had seen this probably a lot of times. They'd probably seen people crucified because that's the whole purpose of crucifixion, that it's a spectacle, that people see it It's a way to shame the victims, to humiliate them publicly, to dehumanize them. 
And so when you see a crucifixion, when you see someone hanging on a cross, the, the symbol is, hey, look, this person is ashamed. Don't do what they did. That's part of the terror of the crucifixion, right? It's to send a signal to the rest of the community. So when Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, they knew what he was talking about. And see, they knew that he didn't require just their physical life. It wasn't just, will you die for me? He's asking, will you be ashamed? Will you endure shame on my behalf? The only analog I have to this in our day, in our culture, in our, in our, in our recent cultural memory, is uh, there's only one thing I can think of, and that is um, in the 50 or so years, or the 100 or so years between the civil rights, between the Civil War and the Civil Rights era, 5,000 men, women, and children were lynched in America. There's an African-American theologian named James Cohn who wrote a book called The Cross and the Lynching Tree. See, the purpose of lynching was to humiliate. It was a spectacle. It was an act of terror that sent signals to the African-American community, right? And so when, if, if we want to understand the crucifixion, maybe we should think of a lynching. In fact, James Cohn said, that it was, a, it was a humiliating death. It was meant to shame and dehumanize black Americans in their communities. And he calls it, he calls the lynching tree the heir to the cross, an echo of the Roman crucifixion. And so what Jesus is asking his followers to do is not just to give up their lives, but to be humiliated and shamed on his behalf. How do I know that's what he's talking about? Because he actually goes on and uses this very language. If we look at verse 35, he says, For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? And then he says these words, For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous, sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed. See, he knows that the death on a cross is not just about physical life, it's also about our social lives. See, many of us will give our lives for, for any number of causes, provided we die a heroic death. Isn't that what Henry V is all about? It's about the glory of dying a hero, of being a martyr on the battlefield. But Jesus is saying, you don't, I'm not asking you to die a heroic death, I'm asking you to, to die a shameful death to be humiliated in front of your your parents and your family and your neighbors and the leaders of your day. You will not be vindicated. You will die a shameful death. See, Jesus knows that shame is a powerful motivator. The author Brene Brown wrote that shame is the most powerful master emotion. It's the fear that we're not good enough. Isn't that what drives some of our pursuit of glory? is to run away from shame, to prove that we're good enough. Jesus knows that that's what we spend so much of our lives on, and he knows that the cross is a dividing line. He knows that to follow Jesus means that you have to consider him to be more valuable than life and more valuable than your reputation, more valuable than your social life. And he says, they will persecute you And he knows that that some of the pain of persecution is not just the physical wounds, but the shame and the embarrassment of following him. Those of you who are younger Christians know this. Middle school, high school, college is not friendly to Christianity. You've been teased. You've been mocked for your faith and for for your faith in Jesus and what he teaches. See, Jesus knows that we will suffer humiliation and shame on account of him. And that sometimes can motivate us more than just the physical pain of persecution. So what he's asking his disciples is he's saying, will you be ashamed of me or will you be willing to be ashamed because of me? And so if you follow him, you will follow him in shame. But here's the good news. He doesn't end his speech there. He doesn't say, okay, now go out and die. He gives us a glimpse of the promise of the cross. This is what he says. As soon as he says that the Son of Man will, 
be ashamed when he comes in, he says, when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And then he said to them, truly I say to you, there's some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. And after it has come with power. See, he points them to two things. He says, yes, I'm going to die. They're going to kill me. And yes, they will kill you too. But guess what? You will see the glory of the resurrection. And then he points them to the glory of his return. The resurrection and the return. He says, some of you will not taste death until you begin to see my kingdom. The kingdom that comes with the beginning of this kingdom that comes with the resurrection. You will see it in front of your very eyes, and that will empower you to live out this call that I'm calling you to do, which is to give your life and your reputation for me. And he's saying, if you're wondering, do you get to participate in that too? The answer is yes. You go through the cross and you get Easter as well. When you give your life, you get the promise of resurrection and you get the promise of his kingdom. And so if you're hearing this message and you're thinking, this is a hard teaching, who can, who can do this? Who can give their lives? Well, as I mentioned, the disciples, those who heard this message, on the night in which he was betrayed, they all fled. They left in shame. And yet, after they had seen the resurrection, they could not get over the resurrection We saw Jesus Christ alive, risen from the dead. We will give anything for him to be in his kingdom. And they gave their lives because they saw the glory of the resurrection and they believed in the promise of his kingdom that was still to come. And so if you're hearing this message today, you're thinking, wow, this does not sound like a lot of grace. This sounds like a lot of hard teaching. I have to give up my life. I have to be ashamed I have to be persecuted for him. I have to reorient everything around him. I have to consider him more valuable than anything I have. Who can do that? How can I do that? Well, the grace in this is the promise that all you give to him will be repaid in the kingdom to come. And the gift is Jesus himself. That's the promise. He says, see, in fact, the the paradox of the cross is this. Jesus' message is not upside down. It's our world that's upside down. And Jesus says, I've come to make it right. And so all the things that you're pursuing now that you think will give you glory, he doesn't say that's not a good quest, the quest for glory. He says, no, I will show you glory that's better than anything else you're seeking. I will give you my life. I will give my life for you. I will become a shame and cursed for you so that you can enter my kingdom. And everything that you give up now, you'll receive something far greater than that in the kingdom to come. And so, yes, it is a hard teaching, but there's grace in the reward that comes, and there's grace in the Spirit that empowers us to follow Him. And there's grace in our own repentance as as we repent of the ways we don't follow this and lean on His sacrifice for us. And that's the thing. He doesn't just ask them to die for him. He also dies for us. He gave his life for us and he rose from the dead and he's coming again to give us his kingdom. And so um, I'll end with this and illustrate it this way. C.S. Lewis, at the end of Mere Christianity, talks about this very passage. And he kind of says the same thing. Like, this is really difficult. Who can do this? And he says, sometimes we hear this, take up your cross, give your life, follow me, And we think it's kind of like paying our taxes. We're all fine and happy to pay our taxes as long as there's something left for us to to live on, right? And he says, but but actually Jesus is not saying give me part of your life. Just give me the, the religious part of your life. He's saying I want it all. I want your whole life. And he says, you have to trust me. You have to trust me for your own life. And he says this way, he says, give up yourself and you will find your real self. Lose your life and you will save it. Submit to death, the death of your ambitions and your favorite wishes every day and death of your whole body in the end. Submit with every fiber of your being and you will find eternal life. Keep back nothing. Nothing that you have not given away will be really yours. 
Nothing in you that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. Look for yourself and you will find in the long run only hatred and loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But look for Christ and you will find him and with him everything else thrown in. So here's the challenge. Will we value Christ above all else? Will we, will we repent when we don't? Will we submit every part of our lives to his teaching? Will we take our own shame to the cross? Will we consider his opinion of us greater than the world's opinion of us? And will we do it all not in our own power, but in the power of the Holy Spirit that, it, that gives us grace to live this out? Knowing that we will receive his glory. We will glorify him when he comes again with the Father and we will receive his kingdom and find the glory that we seek for. He's worth it.